Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So today's video is going to be a case update video as you can tell from the title. So much has been happening in the true crime world the past few months, so I'm so happy that I can come to you guys with these case updates. Not all of them are positive updates, but they do at least give us hope that there's movement in these cases and maybe some of them will even be solved. If you are a member of the Patreon family, then you probably already know about most, if not all, of these case updates because Patreon is where I will post updates first. So if you want to hear about updates as I find them out, make sure you go ahead and check out my Patreon. But with this video, as I did on my last case updates video, I will just be giving a brief reminder of each case, but if you have forgotten or if you're not really familiar with each case that I mentioned in this video, I will link all of the videos that I made on the cases in the description box below. But before we get into today's video, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. If you're anything like me and you are absolutely blind, then you know how expensive it can be and how much of a hassle it can be to get glasses directly from your eye doctor. But with GlassesUSA.com, they've now made it so much easier and so much more affordable. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription eyeglasses up to 70% off of retail prices. You can now shop for your prescription eyeglasses online, at home, all at affordable prices. GlassesUSA.com offers over 4,000 styles of eyeglasses and sunglasses, including in-home brands like Audido, which is what I'm wearing right now. This has been my favorite brand for a while now. I also have these Audido eyeglasses. They are also some of my go-to. Then I have a new pair of Audido Sunnies, which I've been obsessed with. I wear these when I go out to brunches or when I wear a little bit of a nicer outfit. Then I also have my classic everyday pink Muse sunglasses as well. I love having multiple pairs of glasses and Sunnies. I always have a pair of Sunnies in my car and then I have one in my purse to make sure that I always have one no matter where I am or where I go because my eyes are very sensitive to light. So I want to make sure that I always have a pair with me. I also like having an extra pair of eyeglasses in my overnight bag and in my car as well. So if I do end up sleeping over at a friend's house or something last minute, I always have glasses with me to make sure that I'm not left blind and forgetting my glasses. GlassesUSA.com also has designer brands like Oakley, Gucci, Ray-Ban, and so many more. You can find any style and color that you can imagine, as well as specialty glasses like kids glasses, sports glasses, safety glasses, and more. Also with GlassesUSA.com, you can add any prescription to almost any pair of frames, including sunglasses and blue light blocking glasses. They also have this really cool try-on feature where you put a picture of yourself to see how the glasses will actually look on you before you spend the money to buy them, which is always helpful when you're buying glasses online and you're not exactly sure how they'll look on you. The best part of GlassesUSA.com is the price point. A complete pair of glasses starts at only $30 and free basic prescription lenses are included with every frame. It's so easy, all you do is go online, enter your prescription, place your order, and that's it. You're done. Standard shipping is free on all orders no matter how much you spend, and if for whatever reason you aren't happy with your order, you have 14 days to return for a full refund, exchange, or 100% store credit, hassle-free and no questions asked. The exciting news is that by clicking the link down in my description box below, my subscribers can get up to 65% off of their first pair, which is such a great deal considering that their glasses are already so affordable. And if you like the glasses that I'm wearing right now or any of the other other ones that I showed, those will also be linked down below. So again, make sure you go ahead and click the link down in the description box below to get 65% off of your first pair of glasses. Thank you again so much to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring today's video and for your continued support of this channel. So with that being said, let's get into today's case updates. And as always, I will be removing my glasses for the remainder of the video because I know the glare is bothersome for some people. Okay, so with that being said, let's get into these case updates. So let's start with the case of Lauren Cho. Lauren Cho was a 30-year-old woman who moved from New Jersey to California in the fall of 2020 to start off a new life. She had been a teacher, but she was starting to get bored with the mundane 9-to-5 life. So she went with her ex-boyfriend, who was also a very close friend at the time, Cody Oral, to California. They ended up in Bombay Beach before going to Yucca Valley, living in an Airbnb at the time. She was in the process of renovating an old school bus in a food truck when she went missing. On June 28, 2021, Lauren was last seen walking away from her 
her Airbnb in Yucca Valley at around 5 p.m. There were reports that Lauren may have been in a bad mental state at the time with a lot of things going on in her life. Cody had also said that right before she walked off, they had an argument, so it seemed like she may have walked off to sort of cool off after the argument. Either way, many searches had been conducted at the time that I recorded the last video, but she still had not been found. However, on October 9th, 2021, the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office had been doing their search and rescue efforts when they came upon unidentified human remains. These human remains were found in a rugged terrain of Yucca Valley, close to where Lauren was last seen. About two weeks after these human remains were found, they were confirmed as belonging to Lauren Cho. However, as of right now, they still have not determined a cause or manner of death. They are still waiting for the results of the toxicology report. So as of right now, we don't know exactly what happened. All we know is that her body was found, which obviously is very unfortunate and devastating news, but this should hopefully help investigators go in the right direction and get more insight into what happened to Lauren. So hopefully we will find out more answers about her case in the coming months. The next case update is on Maya Maletti. Maya Maletti was a 39-year-old mother of three children. She was last known to be alive on January 7th, when she had suddenly stopped responding to their family's group chat. At the time, she was married to Larry Maletti. However, shortly before her disappearance, the two had been having some marital problems. Family around them were noticing that they were starting to fight pretty often. They just didn't seem like themselves. Then Larry started having some strange behaviors as well. He started confiding in different family members about their relationship issues. However, to them, it seemed like he was more so the problem. According to May's brother-in-law, Richard, it seemed like Larry was sort of the aggressor, but he was trying to give him all this information and trying to get the family on his side. But it got to a point that May was so concerned with Larry's behaviors that she had told a family member that if anything happened to her, that it was Larry. Larry started accusing Using May of having a secret boyfriend to all of her family. Then his behaviors progressed and he started sending text messages to different people in the family with different Bible quotes. And it even got to a point where he had made a shrine with pictures of May and Larry with what looked like blood spattered all over the pictures. It also came out that before May went missing, she had been in contact with a divorce attorney and she had made an appointment with him, which was supposed to happen on January 12th. Then it came out that at around 9.57 p.m. on January 7th, a neighbor surveillance video picked up on nine loud bangs that sounded like gunshots coming from the Maletti home. After all of this happened, after all of this information started coming out, Larry went to the media to talk about how that on the day that May went missing, he had spent the day at the beach with his son, so there was no way that he could have been home to harm her. He told the media that she probably found a new boyfriend, that she went off on her own free will, and that he's not considered a suspect. However, on October 19th of 2021, Larry was finally arrested and charged for the murder of his wife, May Maletti, as well as on charges of illegal possession of a weapon. A SWAT team had entered his home that morning and he was taken into custody at 11.41 a.m. on that day. An investigator came out to say that he was arrested as a result of thousands of hours of investigation, including 67 search warrants, 87 interviews, and almost 130 tips. He said, quote, these efforts ultimately generated a variety of pieces of evidence that have become clear and overwhelming. Larry Maletti, May's husband, is responsible for May's murder and disappearance. He was named a person of interest back in July of 2021, and they had placed a gun violence restraining order on him after police had seized more than a dozen of his guns. However, one of Larry's guns, a 40 caliber pistol, still has not been recovered. Most of the evidence leading to Larry's arrest is circumstantial. This includes the fact that she did contact this divorce attorney the same day that she went missing. Then, of course, we know about his increased erratic behaviors over the months that led to May's disappearance. It also came out that Larry had contacted spellcasters to set a magic spell on May to control her behavior and to try to force her to stay with him. Like, this man was literally doing everything that he could to make May stay with him except for being a better husband. It got to the point where he was asking these spellcasters to cause an accident for May, to cause broken bones and injuries on her, to force her to stay home. This definitely showed that he had some violent thoughts and tendencies towards his wife, May, 
day. So using all of this information, as well as looking at his whereabouts around the time that she went missing, police did ultimately decided that they had enough evidence to arrest Larry. However, unfortunately, her body still has not been recovered, so I really, really hope that they are able to find her and bring her home. I'm really looking forward to what comes out with the trial for this, but as of right now, that's where the case sits. I'm not confident that Larry's ever going to tell us where May's body is hidden. I definitely think he's going to go as long as he can without admitting what he did to his wife. But either way, I'm still so, so very happy to see these charges being brought against Larry. It was so obvious from the very beginning that he was responsible, so I'm glad that they finally have the evidence to lock down and arrest. The next update is regarding the Elijah Snow case. So to remind you of that case, Elijah was a 36-year-old firefighter and a father of two young children. So him and his wife of 10 years, Jamie, went to Mexico to celebrate their 10-year anniversary. However, things took a turn for the absolute worst when on one night, July 18th, 2021, Jamie went back to his hotel room and Elijah stayed at the bar to finish off his last cocktail. However, he never ended up returning back to the room. Instead, he had been found deceased with his body hanging out of a window. His cause of death was ruled as mechanical asphyxia as a result of thoracic abdominal compression after getting stuck in that window. Allegedly. However, Elijah's stepdad actually flew out to Mexico to see his body for himself, and his injuries were more indicative of him being beaten, not just getting stuck in that window. It was obvious and very, very frustrating at that point that he had been beaten and that he did not die as a result of just getting stuck in a window, but his family just got the runaround. They tried to do whatever they could to investigate everything themselves, but the Mexican police made it absolutely impossible. This was a very, very clear cover-up of what happened, but the family just didn't want to give up. They did what they could, but it clearly didn't work. Because as of April 7th of this year, so very recently, I saw that the Mexican police have closed Elijah's case. But justice has not been served for anybody involved in the case and the family is still fighting. I'm going to read to you directly from their change.org petition. Almost nine months and the Mexican government has only sent the family one video that shows Elijah and Jamie near the elevator lobby. They continue to pick and choose still shots from videos that show them in the bar. If they have nothing to hide, why not send the videos also? This route has numerous cameras along it that would give us clear evidence of what took place that evening. Once again, no videos were provided to support this hypothesis. Employees that were interviewed by police had no contact with Elijah and Jamie in the time from their arrival up until the time that he was reported missing. This seems very suspicious to the family. The Mexican government has stated that there will be no further investigation as there was no crime committed. The American politicians that did respond only sent letters to the FBI knowing that there was nothing that they could do without Mexico inviting them to help them. This would only happen through political influence from Attorney General Garland, Secretary of State Blinken, or President Biden, none of which have responded to numerous requests from friends and family of Elijah. The family is considering what steps to take next, which may include a lawsuit against the resorts. We continue to seek justice for Elijah. Continue to sign and forward the petition. Please continue to pray for his young daughters that miss their daddy. So that is definitely not the update that I was hoping for, but I'm still hopeful that with enough push with enough people backing Elijah and his family that maybe something positive can come from continuously spreading awareness on his case. The next update is regarding Brandon Lawson, whose case I covered a very long time ago. For a quick reminder, Brandon Lawson went missing on August 8th, 2013 after him and his girlfriend of 10 years, Ladissa, had gotten into an argument. The two had four children together, with one being a brand new baby, and Brandon was working 60 hours a week and he was getting behind behind on bills, and things were just very, very stressful. He had not been home for the previous night because it turned out that he had recently relapsed on drugs. When he returned home that next day, him and Ladissa got in a huge fight because he had a long history of substance use issues, so this just was not something that Ladissa was happy about. After this fight, he left the family home and called his dad at around 11.30 p.m. that night and told him that he was headed over to his house, which was a three-hour drive from where he lived. He then called his brother Kyle to let him know that he was on U.S. Highway 276 
seven because he had run out of gas and he needed help. So his brother brought him a gas can, brought it to the highway. And during this phone conversation, Brandon's brother got the idea that maybe he had been on drugs at the time. After this, there's sort of a timeline of phone tag with Brandon calling Ladissa and her not answering, I believe because she was sleeping at the time. And then his brother, as well as his brother's wife were calling back and forth, but no one was answering. This was until one phone call with police that took place at 12.54 a.m. going into that next morning. This phone call has been analyzed and slowed down and listened to multiple times, but it's really unclear as to what exactly he's saying but it sounded to them like he was in the middle of a field and he was saying that he needed help. Then he was finally able to get a hold of his brother who answered and in this phone call, it sounded to him like it said that he was bleeding, but this call was very muffled and it was very difficult to listen to. So Kyle doesn't know exactly what Brandon was saying in the phone call. They arrived to his car with the gas can, but they didn't see Brandon. They assumed at that point that he was hiding because there was an officer nearby and Brandon had active warrants out for him, but after that, he had never been seen or heard from again. However, almost a decade after Brandon's disappearance on February 4th, 2022, the Help Find Brandon Lawson Facebook page announced that they had a search party who discovered articles of clothing in the area that he was last known to be in. Once these articles of clothing were found, they had contacted the Texas Rangers who continued searching the area. The DNA tests are still pending, so we don't have a concrete match yet, but it's pretty much assumed at this point that these remains do belong to Brandon. So obviously these are not the answers that the family has been wanting, but I'm happy to see that there's finally a little bit of closure in this case. I'll be very surprised if somehow these remains end up not being him, but most people in this case are confident that they do belong to him. So at this point, of course, the family is just hoping that these remains can give them more answers as to what happened, if foul play was involved or anything else they should know. Of course, I will keep you all updated as we find out more. So the final update that I have for you guys today is probably the biggest update that I'm sharing and I'm sure a lot of you have already heard of it and that is regarding the case of Sherry Papini. So once again, as a brief reminder, Sherry Papini was 34 years old, a wife to her husband Keith and a mother of two young children when she went missing. She was known to have a very happy life, even being referred to as a super mom by those around her. On the morning of November 2nd, 2016, Sherry decided to go out on a jog on that morning in the woods near her home in Redding, California. At the time, her husband was working at his job at Best Buy while their children were at daycare. She told Keith that she would be picking up her children from daycare as normal, but when 5.50 came and went and Sherry didn't pick up the kids, Keith immediately became concerned. When Keith got home from work, he used Sherry's Find My iPhone feature to go out and search for her. When he did so, he saw that her phone was in a wooded area and pretty quickly he found that her phone was still laying in the dirt on the dirt trail along with her headphones and what looked like a chunk of blonde hair laying next to them. So to him, it looked like someone had grabbed her and pulling her hair in the meantime and had kidnapped her. So of course, Keith immediately reported his wife as a missing person. Over the course of the next three weeks, her case made national headlines and everybody was searching for her. Keith went to the media to beg for her to come home safely. They set up a GoFundMe to raise money for a private investigator and they were able to come up with more than $49,000 and then an anonymous donor even donated upwards of $50,000. However, 22 days after Sherry was reported missing, on Thanksgiving Day on November 24th in 2016, Sherry reappeared. She was one Wandering around the highway at around 4 a.m. when she was spotted by a driver about 150 miles away from her home in Redding. The woman who found Sherry said that as she was driving by, she saw this woman who looked absolutely emancipated and terrified. She was running along the highway, waving her arms around, trying to get somebody to stop and pick her up. She clearly looked like she had been traumatized and like she had been through some sort of abuse. She was covered in bruises. She she had chains still on her wrists. Her long blonde hair had been haphazardly cut off. 
She was even seen with a branding on her right shoulder. All of these injuries appeared to be in different stages of healing, so it was clear that she had been abused for an extended period of time. She had also lost a ton of weight, weighing only 87 pounds. When she was originally taken into the hospital, she couldn't really remember what happened and she was really scared to talk to police. But eventually, she was able to recall that she had been kidnapped at gunpoint by two Hispanic women. She remembered that one of these women was in her 20s to 30s and had pierced ears with thin eyebrows and curly black hair with a thick Spanish accent. She said the other captor was 40 to 50 years old with thick eyebrows and straight black hair. Using this, the police were able to come up with a sketch of what they believed these women could look like and they sent these pictures out to the public. She told investigators about how she had been chained up in a room that was completely boarded up and the entire time the women played really loud, annoying music. She said that she was able to escape after these two women got into an argument and one of these women ultimately decided to just let her go. She said that the woman put her in the back of a van and then released her where she would later be found running along the highway. However, there were a lot of details surrounding her disappearance that really made the public and police raise their eyebrows. It came out that she had recently reconnected with a man who lived back in Michigan shortly before her disappearance. She had been planning up on meeting up with this man, but she never got the chance to but police did end up finding him and questioning him and he was ruled out. But there were other things that came out about her mental health that showed that she had struggled with issues like this in the past. There was one incident where she had been hurting herself and she had blamed it on a family member. So back in 2003, she had been accused of misleading police. They also couldn't find any female DNA on Sherry to connect her with her captor or figure out who they were or anything. So a lot of people wondered if she truly had been kidnapped or if she staged this entire thing. Looking back, I remember looking at all of this evidence and I really did not think that she could have made all of this up. Obviously, if you want the more detailed account of everything that happened, make sure you go and watch my past video. But I was reading back from my script from back then and I truly did not think that she made this entire thing up. I do feel like in most of my videos, I tend to give the victims the benefit of the doubt because if she truly did go through something as horrific and traumatic as she said, I don't want to be that person that was just sitting there and accusing her of something if she didn't actually end up doing it because doing that would just cause even more hurt and even more trauma. But as of early March of this year, Sherry Papini was charged with making false statements to a federal law enforcement officer and for engaging in mail fraud. So when Sherry was originally found, she was found to have male DNA on her sweatpants as well as her underwear. Obviously, this was male DNA, so it did not match the female captors that she had described. They also compared it to her husband and it was not his DNA either. So obviously, they had to figure out who this DNA belonged to. So back in 2019, the FBI requested a familial DNA profile in the offender databanks. So I believe that DNA was compared compared to DNA on those, you know, DNA testing sites where people will voluntarily submit their DNA for testing to find out their nationalities and lineages and things like that. So they were ultimately able to find a familial DNA match from someone who had submitted their DNA into one of these websites and they were able to figure out who this DNA belonged to. This DNA ended up belonging to one of Sherry's ex-boyfriends. This man was identified as 37-year-old James Riaz, and he too is from Michigan, but he is not the same guy that I mentioned earlier that she had been talking to. By June 9th of 2020, investigators went to his apartment and then they went through his trash to find an honest honey green tea bottle and they got his DNA that way. And of course, this man's DNA matched the DNA that was found on Sherry's clothing. So by August 10th of 2020, police brought James in for questioning, and this is when he admitted to everything. He said that Sherry had contacted him in 2015, completely out of the blue. He said that the two had dated in the early 2000s and that they were young and in love, but they hadn't spoken in years because Sherry had got married and had kids. But by 2015, James said that he had 
had been cleaning his house and he came across this box of old photos and personal items that belonged to Sherry. So he went ahead and mailed these items to Sherry's parents and then called them to let them know that this package was coming. So he wonders if that is what prompted Sherry to reach out to him. Either way, one day Sherry had given James a call and laid out this entire plan about how she wanted to run away with him. She said that she had been saving money for quite some time and was planning on sending him some of the money for him to have when she got there. This entire time, she had been using burner phones to contact James. She had convinced James to come up with this plan to run away because she had convinced him that her husband had been abusing her. She went as far as saying that her husband was beating and raping her and that she was trying to escape from him. She said that she had told police about the abuse, but they weren't doing anything to help her or stop the abuse. So of course, James was very concerned and he wanted to help her out. So he went ahead and got a rental car and then picked her up and brought her back to his home in Costa Mesa, California, which is around a 10 hour drive away from Reading. During this time that she was there, Sherry had James board up his bedroom and block out any sunlight so that she wouldn't see any sunlight the entire time that she was there to just make it more believable. She had purposely starved herself and lost a bunch of weight so that she would look as emancipated as possible. She had also chopped off her own hair. James described that one day he got back from work and all of her hair was just gone. He said that she wanted James to help him injure her and he did, but he said that he never directly laid a hand on her. For example, at one point she had asked him to shoot her with a pellet gun to help make some of these bruises. She also had James go and get a wood burning tool from Hobby Lobby to use to brand herself, and of course, he paid for it in cash. James said that she used this wood burning tool to brand letters into herself that he didn't actually brand her. James said that when she did this to herself, she didn't even complain about the pain or anything, and that stood out as being really odd to him. During this entire time that she was there, she never left his bedroom. He said that he continued to go to work and would stop at stores to buy her clothes and things like that. But of course, like I said earlier, she would starve herself, sometimes only eating like half a banana in a day. He said that at first when this entire thing started, he was hoping to re-spark some sort of romantic relationship, but nothing ended up happening between them. James said that as boring as it sounds, nothing happened between them. They literally just ended up talking and hanging out and nothing sexual happened between them this entire time. James said that she had planned to stay there for much longer than she did. However, he started to sort of freak out when he saw how much national news coverage her case was getting. Then one day, she told him that she missed her kids and wanted to go back home, so he did ultimately drop her back off. Police were able to obtain cell phone data that showed the two of them texting back and forth, as well as looking at cameras on the highway that showed James's car going to Reading on the day that Sherry went missing. Police also found out that James took off of work on the first and second days of Sherry's disappearance. Police also went ahead and looked at James's apartment to see if it matched with the original description that Sherry gave of where she was being held captive to see if it looked alike, and it did. By August of 2020, police confronted Sherry with the evidence that they found, but she continued to deny it and said that there was no way that she could have been kidnapped by her ex-boyfriend. She said that yes, she did speak with him over text multiple times and that she spoke to other men as well, but it was just a mistake, nothing criminal. She said that she would go out of town for work and yeah, she would talk to other men and she knows she shouldn't have, but she continuously denied that she faked her own kidnapping. The other thing that police were accusing Sherry of was using the money that they had raised in the GoFundMe, which like I said earlier, was upwards of $49,000. After Sherry reappeared, Keith had written himself a $31,000 check from the GoFundMe and deposited it into his bank account. He also wrote Sherry a check for $1,600, which she also put into her banking account. Then it showed that both Sherry and Keith used some of this money to pay off some credit card bills and other personal expenses. The other thing that Sherry had benefited from was that she actually got $30,000 from the California's Victim Compensation Board 
this was supposed to go to therapy sessions for actual victims, but clearly she was not a victim, so she shouldn't have gotten this money. But ultimately, she was arrested on March 3rd of 2022 this year with making false statements and for mail fraud. The officers followed Sherry as she dropped her kids off at their piano practice, and they tried to make the arrest as quiet as possible so that her children wouldn't have to witness her being arrested but she made quite the scene and her children ended up going outside to see what was happening and they did end up seeing her being arrested. She then had a virtual court hearing and she was released on a $120,000 bail and she was ordered to surrender her passport and attend a psychiatric program. So obviously police are very upset about all of the public resources and the money that was wasted during the searches for Sherry. It came out that there was more than $150,000 thousand dollars in public resources spent on these searches which of course is so infuriating and frustrating to think about like the amount of time and money that they spent searching for sherry easily could have been on an actual missing persons case that you know someone that's still out there and still suffering from violence or someone who had been murdered whose families are still sitting back and waiting for their body to be found or for justice toward their victim it's just really disappointing to hear because i did truly think that she had been harmed because I didn't think that there was any way that someone could just make all of this up, but obviously I was wrong. But yeah, that's still where the case sits. She could be facing up to 20 years in prison and a fine of $250,000 if she's convicted. So I'm definitely curious to see where the trial goes for this. It does not seem like she's accepting any responsibility for this. So it'll be interesting to see how the trial goes. And of course, I will keep you all updated on that as well. But other than that, those are pretty much all of the case updates that I have for you guys. I am really excited that there's at least been some movement in the cases that I've been covering over the past couple of years, even if not all the updates are positive ones. If I missed any updates that you know about and if you want to share them, make sure you go ahead and comment them below or go ahead and send me an email to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com and I will keep an eye out for those for my next update video. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you like today's video and you want to see more case updates in the future, make sure you go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram, both be linked down below. Make sure you head over to glassesusa.com for 65% off of your first pair of glasses. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!